and every one of you. Thank you for choosing this as the venue for tonight. Uh, we, we are very honored to have Catherine with us this evening. Uh, just a few things before we begin. First of all, we live in a technological age, which means that most of us probably have one of these. Go ahead and silence that at this time. And then also, if you do need to use the restroom uh, or, you know, just step out, come through this door here and walk down and you'll see the signs overhead that will lead you to the bathroom, water, things of that nature if you need that. Also, after um, the, the talk this evening, there will be a book signing out front with Catherine and you can come and speak with her. I'm sure she would love to speak with each of you. And with that said, brothers and sisters, let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks this evening for this opportunity to gather as friends and examine our lives and to see, Lord, the deep roots of grace present in every aspect, every moment, every nook and cranny. So, Lord, give us this grace this evening to walk together, to glorify you, and let Jesus Christ be present in all things. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, thank you, Sam, and I'm very grateful to First Presbyterian Church for hosting us. We haven't been back here in a bit since COVID, and it's wonderful to host the King Institute for Faith and Culture here yet again. Uh, my name is Martin Dodderweich, and I am the director of the King Institute for Faith and Culture at King University just around the corner. Uh, this was founded as the Beekner Institute, named for Frederick Beekner uh, for Faith and Culture in 2007, and ever since then we've hosted an annual speaker series devoted to creating a space for conversation and friendship about things that matter. Am I good? Do I need to move, or am I good? Is it mine? I see something waving back there, but I'm not sure what it means. <laughs> okay. There's waving. Uh, so we are, uh, we have been trying to find uh, events like this that, that bring people together, to find things that, that, uh, that bring the Bristol community as well as the King College community together, and uh, to give us space to c have conversation and to share friendship uh, for many, many years. Um, one of our recurring visitors has been Katherine Patterson, and we're delighted to welcome her back this year. Our theme this year is Listen to Your Life. We borrowed that from Frederick Buechner, um, his memoir, Sacred Journey. The Sacred Journey turns 40 next year, and we'll have an event celebrating that anniversary with Jeff Monroe, who has written extensively on Fred's work. But the Buechner family, as in conversation with us, uh, gave us their blessing to use this famous phrase from Buechner, listen to your life, and we've asked our speakers this year to reflect on it. This morning, Kathleen gave us a tour de force of listening to her life, and we'll explore that theme a little bit more tonight as well. But I encourage you to see the morning lecture. If you didn't, it's available on our YouTube channel from King. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of our uh, speakers tonight. We will have some question and answer time up here. I'll open it to the floor for a little bit uh, at the end if you have questions or comments. Uh, and then Catherine, we had hoped we were going to be launching her new novel, Birdie's Bargain. Alas, like everything else, it is stuck in the mail. And so we are unable to get the book. Uh, but she has agreed to, uh, as our little soft launch, I guess we'll call it, uh, she's going to do a short reading from the novel. And then at the end, we'll go out to the, uh, to the narthex, and there'll be a book signing by both Kim and uh, Catherine. So do stick around if you can. We're glad you're here. Um, grateful, as always, to the support of, the, of not only King University, but also our community. Uh, many of you have supported us over the years, not just by coming to events, but by supporting us financially, uh, supporting us by sharing things on social media, and by word of mouth, and we are truly grateful for the, the embrace and the support of the Bristol community as well as the university. So thank you, and thank you for being here this evening, whether you're here in person or online. We're delighted to have you as part of this event and hope you'll enjoy spending time with Catherine and Kim as much as we have. Catherine is a graduate of King, and so this is a homecoming for her. She graduated from King uh, in 1954, 
and has come back a number of times. She's the author of more than 30 books, including uh, 18 novels now for children and young people. She's won the Newbery Medal twice, the National Book Award twice, and she has uh, received a number of different other honors, the Hans Christian Andersen Award, the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award, and the Library of Congress named her a living legend. She has been Vice President of the National Ch Children's Book and Literacy Alliance. She's a member of the Board of Trustees of the Vermont College of Fine Arts and a honorary lifetime member of the International Board of Books for Young People. Uh, she, uh, in 2010 to 2011, she was the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Those are a lot of titles and a lot of awards, uh, but for most of us, we know Catherine because she is the creator of wonderful characters and honest and grace-filled stories. The author of Bridge to Terabithia, Jacob Have I Loved, The Great Gilly Hopkins, and now Birdie's Bargain, which I strongly encourage you to get when it's finally available. Many of us are here, thanks to her connection to King, are also privileged to know her as a friend. And we're delighted to have her here again with us. Another friend we welcome back to the King Institute is Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. Uh, Kim lives here in Bristol, although she's a native of Indiana and a graduate of Smith College. She's, been, uh, she's made Bristol home for some time. Bristol, in fact, features in her most recent novel, Fighting Words. I didn't realize this at first, and then I started to read about Food City and all these places, and I thought, this is Bristol. <laughs> I didn't realize it first. Then I, then I started to see if I was in the novel, and I was a little disappointed <laughs> that I wasn't featured in the book. <laughs> next time, next time. I, they all heard you say it. Um, so she has uh, twice been a Newbery honoree for The War That Saved My Life and Fighting Words. The War That Saved My Life and The War I Finally Won uh, are a, a pair of books that many of you will have known from school. My kids read them in school. Um, and the, the War that, fi that Saved My Life was a number one bestseller on the New York Times list. So we are delighted to have two children's writers of such uh, distinction here with us tonight. And please join me in welcoming Katherine Patterson and Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. We talk a little bit about the, the theme tonight, but I want to start with a little bit about writing for children. And I want to ask you to do something I, that I hope isn't too uh, going to throw you off too much. But I'd like you to introduce us a little bit to each other's work. Tell us what uh, Catherine's work has meant to you, Kim, and then we'll switch it out. That's actually a great question. I like that. Um, and it is, it is honestly uh, such a thrill for me to be on stage with Catherine Patterson. I've been saying that you know, on, on Twitter, oh, nothing Monday except you know, I'll be on stage with Catherine Patterson. <laughs> so um, this, is, this is a big thrill for me. Um, Catherine Patterson writes about characters who don't have necessarily easy lives and aren't necessarily on the surface all that lovable. Uh, Gilly from the great Gilly Hopkins is uh, in yet another foster home and coming up with all of the ways she can uh, possibly think of to sabotage the situation, putting gum in her own hair before she goes off to school for the first time. Uh, making up what I still think is one of the funniest cards ever, limericks or verses in uh, to to make her teacher angry. Um, I'm not going to recite it, but I could. Please don't. <laughs> but I could. Uh, and then, you know, you have the characters from Jacob I Have Loved, uh, which uh, there's, uh, based on Jacob and Esau, it's two sisters in a remote New England town who, is it New England? Is it farther down? No, it's off the coast of uh, Maryland. Maryland, okay, so not quite New England, but uh, and, and the, the narrative character just hates everything about her other sister. And um, these, these were books that I read, you know, in high school and, and um, in college. And I brought my copy of Gilly because it was a textbook for the children's literature class I took in college. This is the 1987 version. Um, but all of these characters by the end, even though they're difficult and realistic and very honest, uh, you're rooting for them. You're, you know, you, they don't start off easy, uh, but you really hope that they're going to succeed and do well. And honestly, 
Um, I've said before that I thought that Gilly Hopkins paved. In fact, I was, I was three years ago when we talked about this. I said, knowing that there was the voice of that angry child that you could say in children's literature meant that there was a voice for what I wanted to write. And um, probably the secret I was keeping from everybody right then is I had finished the very short, horrible, nascent first draft of Fighting Words at that point. And um, it drew from things I had learned and thought about from Gilly from all of these years ago. So, um, I mean, everything comes from lots of different places. And, you know, you're going to take things in a blender um, to get your characters and things. But I really think that a lot of the work I did would, uh, wouldn't be here without the work that Catherine did. Well, <clears throat> I don't know quite what to say, except when I read Fighting Words, um, I thought, and this didn't win the Newberry? I mean, I can't imagine there was anything better anywhere around than this book. Uh, I was so moved by it. Of course, I was weeping. And, uh, and I don't cry all that easily over other people's work, but boy, was I done in by that. And I, the first book of, of Kim's I read was the, uh, uh, the War That Saved My Life. And I thought, what does she know about England that she can write <laughs> this well? <laughs> of, I know she lives in the United States, but it's, it's such a wonderful book about that era and about the displaced children. And the child is, wants to be displaced because uh, we're, her home is, is, is not any home that any child should ever be um, subjected to. Um, so Kimberly knows how to love the unlovable and the oppressed. Don't let her kid you for one minute. She didn't learn it from me. <laughs> <laughs> she, she knows in her heart uh, how children feel deeply uh, and how strong they are in the midst of, <laughs> of, of oppression um, from adults. Um, and it, it, it's always been so hard for me to see how powerless children feel uh, just because they're smaller <laughs> uh, and how we take advantage of that and, and do not give them the respect as human beings that they deserve. Uh, and boy, does Kimberly do it in her books, the wonderful respect, uh, not only for the child character, but for the child reader that expects a lot from the reader and knows that the reader uh, is capable of understanding these deep feelings uh, that she uh, gives them through her characters. So uh, if she's proud to be up here with me, boy, am I ever proud to be up here with her. So <laughs> She's going to end up making me cry. I, I hope you all enjoy <laughs> us as much as we enjoy each other, that's all I got to say. <laughs> Uh, Catherine, to pick up on the theme you just introduced uh, of the way that we think about uh, children and their place and, and, and what they're able to hear and what they're able to, to bear and read, I wonder if each of you would com comment a little bit about what you see the importance of writing for children to be and how important it is for children to read. Now you go first. With that. No, no. I got to think for a minute on that. <laughs> Let's see. Um, there were two parts to that. Give me, you know, I'm very elderly. Part one and part two, again, Martin. I don't remember them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a so, big help, isn't it? Uh, uh, well, I think... Of course, children's literature and for children... Yeah. Why, so, well, there's two different things. Yeah. Why are the books important and, and why is reading important? Yeah, are two different things. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, well, yeah, uh, and I'm sure uh, Kim has had this too, but, um, you know, the people that... So you write for children, when, it, when are you going to be good enough to write for adults? Which infuriates me, <laughs> because it shows how little respect that person has for children. And if they, you know, I don't know any of 
my friends who write for adults, who have readers who would read their books over and over <laughs> and over again and save their tattered copies to pass down to their own children. Do you know any adult writers that have that experience? Do you, Kim? No. Not a, I've never met them. <laughs> Nobody's bragged to me how many times somebody's read their book. Um, and it's an honor to write for readers who care so deeply about books and who come to your book with the expectancy and hope that this is going to be the best book they ever read. Don't yeah, you think? Uh, without a doubt. And, and actually, one of my favorite comments is um, until I read your book, I didn't know there was anyone else like me who had this problem or this thing that they loved or this family situation or, you know, whatever it is where they say, I didn't know there was anyone else like that. I felt alone until I read your book. And that, that to me is, in a nutshell, why you want to write for children. Because, uh, you know, adults kind of have this con conception that, you know, there's an awful lot of people in the world, probably some of them have been through these things before. But children don't. And um, giving them that sort of broadening, but also that understanding uh, that they really aren't alone and they don't need to feel alone and they can get through whatever it is they're facing. And you, know, the, you get, when you write about uh, kids in difficult situations, you get a certain amount of pearl clutching from people that say, oh, it just is horrible to think, what if some child really has to go through this? And I always want to say, you know, do, do a little of the research that I've done. It's not if. Um, there's no if. This is, you know, this is why we give these kids these books, is so that they can, and not just, that. I mean, I'm not only writing to the kids that have some kind of um, understanding of what it's, what it's like. I mean, and you're writing to be entertaining and to be funny and all of these other things also. But, um, but that's an important part of it. And that's something that means a lot to me. And, and also, you were going to write for children who've never had this experience mm -hmm. to let them feel how it might be. Yeah. And understand other people better. Right. Uh, who are going through this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, moving on to the other part of that, what, what do you think about the uh, importance of reading, or just stories in general? Well, that's um, another different for the, question. For the shaping of people of any age. Tell us, so, so when, when you started to do this as a profession, and you started to craft stories, uh, in, in what way did your own experience of story begin to kind of drive that? And wh why do we need stories? So, okay, first of all, why we need stories and why kids need to learn to read are two separate things. Because a, a child could go their life without reading the scribbles on the page and, and be perfectly, um, you know, you talked about being in a, in a community in Fiji where everyone was used to the oral tradition. And I think about um, the child I met on, on a school visit that was born blind and was one of the best battle of books competitors the school had because she listened to all the books on audio and had a really good memory. And so the decoding of the words on the page was not remotely the point. Uh, and, I, and I try to always tell kids that when I go to schools to say, uh, nobody hates reading this, because reading is not the decoding on the page. But it is a skill they have to learn. And so you have to, it, that's also important, um, which is something else that means something to me. But to me, the stories are the important part. And, uh, and they don't have anything to do with the marks on the page. And I think um, you, if you, you know, some children are afraid of books. It's, mm -hmm. it's so formidable. And it's so important for the adults in their lives to read aloud. Mm -hmm. um, my son-in-law, who is a high school English teacher, started reading Jane Austen to his daughters when they were in the womb. Uh, and that, that may be a little early, but um, <laughs> it's hardly too early to start reading, to give children the, just the beauty of the language, uh, a reading poetry. I read uh, um, poetry to my tiny, tiny grandchild, and this is a child who was fidgety and everything, but the, the soothing language of the poetry 
she was very calm and listened to it for a long, long time mm -hmm. before she thought it was time to get off my lap and do something yeah. else. Uh, and um, a lot of children don't know the joy of books until someone reads a book aloud to them. Yeah. And the fact that schools have gotten to the point where teachers don't spend the last uh, half hour of every day reading aloud, which was the only reason some of us could stand to stay in school mm -hmm. was waiting for that last half hour of reading aloud. And um, w then you think, well, now the child can read. I stop, I'll stop reading aloud. And um, an organization I belong to has done studies and found out that about when a child is eight or nine, is the time they start re stop reading for pleasure, and it's exactly the time that people don't read to them <laughs> for pleasure anymore. Uh, so um, I was <laughs> telling it, I guess it was at supper, about my youngest daughter who loved reading and learned to read before she started school, and she was the only one of my children that I, when they were, I think, in middle school, I gave her a copy of War and Peace because I thought she was the only one of my four children who would appreciate it. Uh, and when she was telling me in her adolescent rebellion against my mother, against her mother, who happened to be me, uh, and all the things I did wrong, she ended it up with, and besides, you never read out loud to me anymore. <laughs> she's 17 years old, and she's complaining that her mother has stopped reading aloud to her. And I thought, Oh my goodness, I could have been reading aloud with Mary on and on, and I stopped when she was probably in middle school. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so read aloud to your children, please. <laughs> and, and you know, of course, there comes a time if you're reading Charlotte's Web to your children, and you, you know Charlotte's gonna die, you can't stand to read it, because you're, in fact, I remember one of my kids you were John, I guess, punching me, saying, don't cry, Mom, you always ruin it when you cry. <laughs> and of course, I burst into tears, and then I have to hand it to one of the children to finish the book, because I can't go on. But, and that's okay, you know, you can share that, the reading task if you need to, but do it together, for heaven's sake. So I have, I have a, a brief story that, that just piggybacks off on the reading aloud, because I did read aloud to my children until, uh, they pretty much forced me not to. The last book I read to my daughter was, in fact, Pride and Prejudice. Um, and, and she thought it was funny, so she was old enough for it. But uh, I'm friends with the British author Hilary McKay. Uh, and a long, so a long time ago, when my, daughter, when my son was nine or ten, he was absolutely in love with her book, Safi's Angel. And there was going to be a sequel to Safi's Angel. And... Um, through my editor at the time, I was able to get an ARC, an advanced review copy of Safi's Inc., of the sequel, uh, before it hit the bookshelves anywhere. And I gave it to my son, and he looked at it, and he said, I'll let you read it to me. Meaning, you know, I won't read ahead. We can experience this together, which was really a, a gift. He meant it that way, and it was a lovely book. And we got to the end, and he says, Mom, do you ever get so happy at the end of a book that you cry? And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> we sat there weeping over this absolutely brilliant book. So um, yeah, that, that was really, um, I think that that is incredibly important. Um, but we need kids to also be able to decode the squiggles so that they can, can, can succeed at school. And the way to do that is to make it so that they're interested enough that they don't stop reading in eight, when they're eight and nine, because when they're nine and 10, they have to read history and they have to read chemistry or science or whatever. So now reading's a tool to learn all these other things. Uh, so, yeah. So you have to, so, okay, I'm gonna be on my soapbox for a minute. I'm sorry, you knew I would. Um, I have a couple of soapboxes, but I'll start by saying, you have to let the kids pick what they're going to read. Uh, and you have to let them like what they like. And it might not be what you want them to read. Um, and I'm still getting teachers that are assigning Charlotte's Web to their children, and I love the book, and that book 
was not new when I was eight years old. And there's a lot of new stuff out, and it might be that your kids um, like nonfiction. Uh, you know, there's a book called Jurassic Poop, and it is about dinosaur poop. And the importance, it's literally about how did we discover dinosaur poop? What, how do you know it's dinosaur poop instead of a rock? Uh, what is the importance of dinosaur poop? Why is it fossilized? It's all of this science stuff. It's here's how to make your own imitation dinosaur poop. And here's how a scientist could prove it wasn't really di I mean, it goes on and on and on. And if that's what your kid loves, love it. I mean, I have um, seven nephews, and the oldest is 12. And they uh, are obsessed with graphic novels. Not the baby, not the one-year-old. But, you know, if Dogman or, you know, Captain Underpants. OK, this is not, um, this is if James Bond was written by a fourth grade boy who thought that nothing was funnier than poop jokes. I mean, that's exactly what you would get. You would get Captain Underpants. They're reading it like they, I, I mean, I, I was, I took my little, two of my nephews to the bookstore and, you know, oh, a brand new Captain Underpants and the, the child's reading it out loud on the way home and just falling over with laughter. And he was in first grade, you know, and he's reading fourth grade words pretty, pretty doggone good. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's how many of us are busy reading War and Peace because that's our reading level? No, we're busy reading, you know, something on, what did I just, I was taking back my library books. Yeah, I had to move them out of the way for Catherine and right on top is A Duke by Default. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm reading. <laughs> well, I finished it, it was good. And, um, you know, because that's what I found entertaining last week. So uh, don't take that away from them by continually pushing what you remember like, or what you remember somebody telling you was a good book back 40 years ago. Um, as, and, and teachers ought to just be saying, here, you know, read what you want to read and then just keep reading it. And if they want to read it 47 times, God bless them. They've read that 47 times in a row. Perfect. They're going to learn to read. Yeah. Would you tell us a little bit about the soapbox uh, that takes I, us to the You know adoption? I would love to. You know I was waiting to do that. So um, several years ago, I was speaking at the Tennessee Association of School Librarians, and I was getting ready for the talk and came upon a statistic. And I originally came upon it for Tennessee, but then I looked it up for the whole United States, and it is this. If you take all of the public school children, fourth graders, public school fourth graders in the country, and you divide them by the kids that get free lunch because their parents are below, I think, 200% of the federal poverty line or whatever the free lunch thing is, and the kids that don't get free lunch, the kids that get free lunch are two and a half times less likely to read at a proficient level than the kids whose parents pay for lunch. That's the only national tracking economic indicator we have. That's why they use free lunch or not two and a half times more likely to read at a proficient level if your parents can afford to pay for lunch. And there's just no way that that should happen in this country. I really, I mean, I thought that that was just a stunning social injustice. And I came home angry and um, told all my friends that I was angry. And my friend Tracy Griffith said, I am also extremely angry. This is wrong. It should not happen. So we, um, we sat around being mad for a little while and, and learning things, and then we created the Appalachian Literacy Initiative, uh, which we are now in our fourth school year of. It's a 501c3 nonprofit, and we give low-income Appalachian kids books of their choice. And one of my very early board members is here in the audience. But we, um, we give teachers four times a year, we send the teachers a set of six books and let all the kids look through the books and pick the one that they want to have a copy of and then we mail them copies of it. So we're in Bristol, we're at Stonewall Jackson, Washington Lee, um, Highland View, Anderson, we're in Bluff City Elementary this year. We were in Blountville till they closed. We'll be in Fairmount this year. And then we have other schools in Kentucky, North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, um, West Virginia, and one this year in New York State, which is uh, way up. We use the federal definition of Appalachia, and it is way up in the top edge. Uh, that school is only third through fifth graders, and they read it. 15% of their students read it grade level. So, um, and that's, we'll take any 
school with more than 50% lunch. Most of our Bristol schools are really low income, but uh, they have a lot of low income kids, but they are reading at relatively high levels, which is good. But when we go into the schools and we're handing out books, it's often the first book the kid has ever owned. So, um, and, and you know, there are some really lovely award-winning books in our list. I mean, The Girl Who Drank the Moon, which won the Newbery, is, is, a, is a hot new book this year, but we also have Dog Man and Captain Underpants, so. <laughs> and Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And oh, we don't have Jurassic Poop anymore because it went out of print and I couldn't get enough, but we have uh, one called uh, Animal Smackdown, which is, you know, which is stronger, a bear or a fire ant? You'd like to know, wouldn't you? See? Yeah. So we are now in um, a borrowed headquarters. World headquarters is uh, inside Bristol Faith in Action, and we're there every day, every Tuesday from 1 to 4 for sure. So if anyone wants to come by, just knock by the loading door. So that's my rant. That's my, that's my big story. But also, you know, you can't, re reading is going to be like riding a bicycle. If you don't own a bicycle, you're not going to learn how to ride one. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a skill. You have to practice it. It's going to come to some kids easier than others, but it's not going to come to any of them if they don't get books. I mean, I can't read anything in Arabic. I've, nobody's ever taught me. I don't own anything that's Arabic. Uh, you know, but we know that the kids, the poor kids are learning in school at the same rate as the, as the uh, higher income kids, and then they go away in the summer and they've got nothing to read and they fall off. And if you do this over six years, you're two years behind by the end. And it's not that they're not learning, it's that they're not practicing. So, yeah, that's my whole, I'll try to make that my whole rant, and thank you, Martin, but you, know, you can tell, I, this is something I really care about, and something I think is really important, so. Tuesdays one to four. Tuesdays one to four, we'll, we'll show you around. You have to wear a mask. That's the place to be. Yeah, knock on the side uh, by the loading dock. <laughs> When you're speaking about the variance in, in reading and how great it is for a child to have the opportunity to read something that is fun as well as other things that are of different kinds of genres. Um, also, I think we just set a record for the use of the word poop in any uh, King Institute event. Uh, <coughs> just in be lucky I said section. poop. <laughs> I, I really, really took a new record for us there. So in, in fighting words, I knew that my character would cuss a lot, but I knew I wasn't going to be allowed to get away with that when I was trying to market it to 10-year-olds, so we substituted the word snow. <laughs> Anytime that some character cussed, we just substitute snow, go to snow, that kind of thing. <laughs> 86, I counted. So if she starts saying snow, I just want you to know what's happening <laughs> up here on the stage. It's worse than poop. Okay, sorry. So when we talk about the variance in the kinds of reading, uh, both of you all have uh, written about characters and stories that are very difficult stories. These are hard things. Um, where do you see that fitting? And I know, Catherine, you, have, you were kind of a pioneer in this, writing stories that were uh, not easy. Um, tell us a little bit about how you see those kinds of stories fitting into the stories that a child grows up with and what it's been like to be to tell those to stories. Talk about bridge to journey. Well, uh, I think uh, something Kim said earlier, a book has to be enjoyable to read. Uh, if, you, if it's not enjoyable to read, who's going to read it? Nobody with any sense, <laughs> unless it's required, right. and which makes it even more painful. Uh, but we all write books out of our own lives, our own experience, and our own um, passions. And um, I wrote Bridge to Abivia, which is my best known book by far, um, because my son's best friend, who was a girl, was struck and killed by lightning. It was a clear day at Bethany's Beach. Nobody suspected lightning. Uh, there was, someone said later, thunder way off in the distance, but the lifeguards didn't see any need to clear the beach. And one little girl dancing on a rock above the beach uh, suddenly was fell by a bolt of lightning. Totally unbelievable. 
um, a kind of tragedy that you simply cannot wrap your head around. Uh, it happened to my son the summer after I had been diagnosed with cancer. So the children thought their mother was going to die. And then David's best friend is killed in this bizarre uh, evidence. And my children were a mess. I was a mess. And I began to write a story because nothing made sense. And I know a story has to make sense because it has a beginning and a middle and an end. And when you get to the end, somehow emotionally or not particularly intellectually, the beginning and the middle make sense for you when you get to the end. So I began to write a story to try to make sense out of something that made no sense to me. And of course, it, it was the hardest thing I ever did. I got to the chapter when I knew that when I went to work the next day that Leslie Burke would die. And so I did the only thing I could do to keep her alive, and that was to stop writing. And I didn't write for some time. And then I happened to be having lunch with an old school friend. And she said, as people will to writers, how's your new book coming? And she knew nothing about what I was writing. And I blurted out, well, I'm writing a book about a friendship between a boy and a girl, and the girl will die. And I can't do it. And I said, I guess I just can't face Lisa's death again. And she looked me straight in the eye and she said, Catherine, I don't think it's Lisa's death you can't face. So I went home and I thought, well, if it's Lisa's death, it's one thing. If it's my death, I have to face it. And so I started writing and I wrote a little bit like a mad woman. <laughs> and I shipped it off to my wonderful editor. And as soon as I mailed it, I realized what a stupid thing I'd done. Um, no real writer would ever send a raw manuscript like that to an editor. <laughs> but I couldn't get it back out of the mail. <laughs> So I just had to wait until I heard from her, which was a long, long few days. <laughs> and she called me on the phone, and I was hardly breathing when I realized she was on the phone. She don't, I don't think she'd ever called me on the phone before. She'd always written me. And she said, Catherine, I, I wanted to talk to you about your new manuscript. And I, I, I think I actually stopped reading. And she said, I laughed through the first third and cried the first two thirds and cried through the last third. And I began to breathe again because I knew as awful as it was, she understood what I was trying to do. And she said, now let's turn it into a book. And then she asked me the question that turned it into a book. She said, is this a book about death or is it a book about friendship? And I had thought until that moment it was a book about death because it had been a year all about death for us. But as soon as she asked me that question, I said, well, it's, it's a book about friendship. <laughs> and she said, well, now you have to go back and write it that way. She said, in any real friendship, both friends will change and grow because they know each other. And I see how knowing Leslie has changed Jesse, but I can't see how Jesse has changed Leslie. So that was the question I had to answer in order to turn this into a real book and not just a cry of pain. And 
up from the giant playground of Calvin E. Twiley School arose Pansy and her two big friends who bullied me when I was in fourth grade at Calvin H. Wally School. And I said, Pansy, I'm going to get my revenge. <laughs> I'm going to put you into my book. But <laughs> of course, I'll never know why Pansy. Isn't that a wonderful name for a villain? I couldn't name her Pansy because I was afraid the real Pansy would come and get me. But uh, I thought, I, I don't know why Pansy was a bully, but people aren't born bullies. What has happened to Pansy that has made her a bully? But I had to understand what made Janice Avery a bully. And of course, when I began to understand more about who Janice was and what her life was, I first began to feel sorry for her, and before I finished, I really liked her, and it ruined a perfectly good revenge, but it actually made a better book. Uh, so anyhow, that's far too much. <laughs> well, that's, all right, so that's, first of all, the reason that Bridge to Terabithia endures, because it's about a friendship, and every kid understands that yeah. in the end. I mean, because really, your average 10-year-old doesn't really want to read the most depressing book they've ever read about death. I mean, you know, why, why would you? And, and, when there's you know Captain Underpants, but um, but they all want to read about about friendship. But um, but I have an amazingly similar story about fighting words. So I, I wrote fighting words. Uh, I wasn't expecting to. I got a little mad about something, which I no longer tell people what I got mad about because then the the conversation gets into whether or not I should have been mad or whose side I should have been on and all. So I was a little angry and. I didn't know what to do with being angry, so I sat down and I was in the middle of something else and I opened up a new file on my book and I always title it in the old fashioned way. I still write in Courier, by the way, on my computer. I'm the only person I know that does. Do you? I used to. Used I got, to. I had to oh, okay. All right. Okay. Well, Courier, Courier is, um, you know, the old typewriter kind of font. So. Oh, I thought you said cursive. No, no, courier, the, the typewriter font. Sorry, yes, yes. No, I don't write in cursive. I write, uh, but, but the old typewriter font. So I started a new file, and I titled it Whatever, and I started writing. And the very first thing I wrote, and I, 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 I do copious amounts of uh, editing. I do a lot of drafts, seven and a half for this one. But the very first words I typed when I was just angry at the world um, turned out to be the exact beginning of this book. So, My new tattoo is covered by a Band-Aid, but halfway through recess, the Band-Aid falls off. I'm hanging my winter coat on the hook in our fourth grade classroom when my teacher, Ms. Devante, walks by and gasps. Della, she said, is that a tattoo? I hold up my wrist to show it to her. It's an ampersand, I say, careful to pronounce the word correctly. I know that, Ms. Devante says. Is it real? It's so real, it still hurts, and the skin around it is red and puffy. Yes, ma'am, I say. She shakes, shakes her head and mutters, I am not one of her favorite students. I may be one of her least favorites. I don't care. I love, love, love my am ampersand tattoo. And then it says, I'm 10 years old. I'm going to tell you the whole story. Some, story. Some parts are hard, so I'll leave those for later. I'll start with the easy stuff. And um, I mean, that's honestly, and I, I really was just, I wasn't thinking at all. I had not planned. I had not done any kind of, you know, character studies or outlines or thought or anything. And at the end of the next day, I had 39 pages that was just absolutely awful, but it had that paragraph and it was a rough narrative arc. And see, the thing is now is you have to like actually print something and put it into an envelope and put a stamp on it and walk it to the mailbox and all. And no, I just hit send. <laughs> and then, of course, you can't undo that. So then, of course, you can't breathe, because that doesn't mean they're going to read it right away, either. Um, and my editor called, and we have um, differing recollections on exactly how she phrased what the heck it was I had just sent her. And I said, I swear to you, I can turn that into a book. And she said, well, okay, then we're in. And I said, really? Are you really in? She said, we are in. And so I started enumerating all the points that I needed her to still be in, like, can I say snow, you know, all the time, over and over. And she was like, Kim, in, get to work. 
So. Yeah, so seven and a half drafts later, it became a book. It wasn't instant, but, um, but yeah, no, it was, it was the exact same sort of thing. You start with some kind of emotion, and you think, okay, here's this, here's this emotion driving this. Now, what is the story about? So. I will never again hear the, the song, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, <laughs> quite the same way. The so. problem with snow, which I thought was the most brilliant solution I had ever seen in a book when I saw it, was that you say, now, what cuss word does this snow stand for? And you <laughs> spend a lot of time trying to figure out. <laughs> because, you know, if, if you... Uh, I could tell you. For, <laughs> I'm sure you can. <laughs> so I, my oldest nephew, when he's mad at his mother, calls her ma'am. <laughs> Okay, ma'am. <laughs> to understand that joke, you have to have read the word that saved my life. But if you have read it, it's pretty funny. <laughs> That's good. So. Uh, tell us about your relationship with uh, readers. I think another a beauty of writing for children, as opposed to the writing for the adults, is some of that interaction that you, you get to have on a regular basis. Um, how does that help you understand the work you're doing and how does it help shape your writing to be able to interact with, with young readers? Uh, I always tell young readers that they're my co-authors because everybody comes and it's a different book uh, when, according to the reader. So I never tell, I never will say the moral of this book or what I, the message I want the reader to take away because that's the reader's privilege and I got the most amazing letter a couple of years ago from a young woman who said she was 16 years old but she felt like she needed to tell me what Bridget Terabithia had meant to her when she was 10 and she said I knew there was something different about me I'd and I didn't fit in, and I didn't like what my parents w expected of me. And then I read Bridge to Terabithia, and in it the boy does girl things, and the girl does boy things, and it saved my life. And I realized that I didn't have to be like everybody else, I was different. And she said, I just wanted to tell you how much it helped me. And she said, I, and this, this letter, a wonderfully written letter, goes on for at least two typed pages. And she gets to the end and she said, I guess you didn't want to read all this from some queer kid in California, but I just had to tell it to you. And I thought, did I write that book for a queer kid in California? Never occurred to me that this was a book that a child who knew she was different from everybody's expectations but couldn't deal with it found to be a book of hope for her. And I thought, thank you, Lord, that I don't get to tell a child how to read my book because God, the right reader will find what he or she must have uh, in a book. I was uh, speaking at a, a classroom full of kids in Oklahoma once, and uh, about I was actually there as part of the uh, book tour for the war I finally won. But I was talking to it; it was just coming out, so you're you're talking to kids who haven't read it. Um, because uh, I couldn't possibly have read it yet. And, but this, a lot of the kids had read The War That Saved My Life, which is you know, the prequel. And r there's always a kid or two that hangs out on the edge of the crowd and wants to come and talk to you afterward. They don't ask a question during. Uh, but this, this little girl came up to me and looked at me very intently, and I kind of leaned over. And she said, I'm in foster care. Now, the girl in uh, the evacuee in World War II England is not in foster care, but it's a very similar thing. And I, and I looked at her, and you know, she just told me. She didn't ask a question. And I said, that's very difficult. You must be strong and brave. And she said, yes, I am strong and brave, and walked away. 
<laughs> she, yeah, she didn't want, she just wanted me to know that she was like, you know, how she saw herself like the character in the book. And again, I didn't write for her, but yeah, you, you don't know. Um, and lately, I, I have a book called Halfway to the Sky, which it came out in 2004, I think. It's the one that had just come out when I went to ALA in Atlanta, and I got to meet Catherine for the first time from afar, staring. Um, but um, that was you know, 20 years ago, and I, I, got, I get emails and letters now, and I just, I just got one today, so I was thinking of it, um, from women in their early 30s to mid-30s who say, I want to write to you and let you know what halfway to the sky meant to me. Uh, and, and I mean, the one that sends a picture of herself on top of Mount Katahdin, and having climbed the whole Appalachian Trail uh, and, and different things. Today's was someone who had had a sibling die um, right before they read the book, which is about someone whose sibling has died. And so, like, I'm writing this book now and you've and we don't know who we're going to touch. And we might never know, but maybe in 10 years or 20, you know, maybe 20 years, somebody will send us an email and say, when I was 10, I needed that book. Um, and, you know, they might not send an email, but they were still 10 and needed the book. So that's, that's an extraordinary privilege as a writer, an extraordinary privilege. I was speaking um, in a city that I won't mention. And... Um, there was a woman who came in, a young woman who came in and sat in the back and waited until the auditorium cleared. And then she came up to me and she said, I live in, actually in an adjourning state, but I heard you were going to be there and I had to come see you because um, Bridge, in the beginning it was bridge therapy if you saved my life. And she said, I grew up in a family uh, where there was incest, and I, I, that's all I knew, and I thought other families were like that. But um, one day I went to school and somebody had written my family's secret in huge letters in chalk right in front of the school. And I started to turn around and run away, but I had just read Bridge to Terabithia, and I remembered what Leslie had said to Janice Avery. And if you've read the book, you know that Leslie had said to Janice, uh, just pretend that you don't even know what they're talking about, and if by next week they will have forgotten it. And so I just squared my shoulders and walked into the building. And uh, she said, I had to come 200 miles to tell you that. And I thought, how can you expect that kind of reaction? I mean, it's, it's actually a miracle. It truly is. And when I was trying to become a writer, I would go hear real writers speak, and they talk so hokey, I thought, <laughs> If I ever get to be a real writer on a stage talking about writing, I am not going to be hokey, for heaven's sake. I am so hokey. <laughs> and it's because the whole thing is just a miracle to me. I mean, kids say, say to me when I go to school, how do you know how we feel? They see my white hair and my wrinkles. They say, how do you know how we feel? And I say, I don't know how you feel. I only know how I feel. But somehow, it's this miracle connection between reader and writer. I think that's the most wonderful thing about being a, a writer is that you have readers. And it tells us, I think, a bit about the, the theme that we have articulated, listen to your life that in a sense, as I hear other stories, I begin to hear my own. Uh, Buechner says that, as I, that hearing other people's stories is like looking at a photo album. And as you look through the photo album, you see places that might be familiar, and eventually you might even see yourself. And that this is what you begin to see as you read somebody else's story or hear somebody else's story. 
Um, so I think it's a great testament from both of you to the thing that we are exploring this year as a theme uh, about listening to your own life. Um, I want to open it to the floor in just a moment. I do want to ask, um, I think there's a, for me, it's never been a question because I think my parents modeled this for me, but it seems to me there's, a, there's something wonderful about continuing to read ch children's literature as an adult, um, not just to your kids, but to continue to read it for yourself. Um, how do you uh, envisage that uh, as an adult reader of your own work? Do you, do you read other children's writers for pleasure or just for professional need? How do you approach the question of continuing to read literature for children in, in later years? Well, yesterday I read a book called The Only Black Girls in Town by Brandy Colbert, just because it had excellent reviews and kind of an attractive title. Um, and that, that was very, very good. It's the first of hers I've read. Um, last week I read Ruta Cepeda's new book, which isn't out yet, but I had a, an electronic uh, galley call. And what's it? It's called I Must Betray You. I think something like that. I'm afraid. I, I, I think it's just called I Must Betray You. And it's an absolute masterpiece. Ruta Cepedes is, writes historical fiction like no one else. It's Romania, uh, Romania's rebellion against Kaseku in 1989, mm. um, seen through the eyes of a 17-year-old boy. Uh, it, but it's, so, I mean, I read these things all the time because that's, I really like to read them. I read other things, too. Mm. But it's really because I really like to read them. And I, <laughs> I was in a book club, and um, I had just joined the book club and they, uh, the person who had asked me to join assigned the war that saved my life. And uh, we were halfway through discussing it, and somebody said that it was a children's book. And the, the oldest member of the group, who I will not name because you all probably know her, said, children's book? Who said this was a children's book? I said, well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it was. I thought, okay. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, I... I used to read a lot more children's books because I was living in communities with a lot of children's authors. And uh, then when I moved to Vermont, although there are many children's authors there, um, I joined a book club and the woman in charge uh, said, uh, I have to read children's books for a living, so we are not going to read any children's books in this book club. <laughs> and uh, so I have to sneak to read children's books. Uh, that wasn't Vicki Smith, was it? Uh, no, no, no. Okay, good. Grace she lives Green. up there. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, I, now uh, you, you read some, a children's book, uh, and then you really, I mean, I read The War That Saved My Life, and I thought, Wow. <laughs> and so I've been reading a lot more of Kim's books. And so that's what happens, you know. I, I, know, I get to know the writer and want to know their books. Or um, somebody says, oh, you, you really have to, you have to read this one. And then, um, what, several years ago, I was chair. In fact, twice I've been chair of the jury for the National Book Award, which means you read Parts of 400 <laughs> books for children, uh, and, and uh, which is a great privilege because you're with four other really smart people uh, talking about children's books for a year, uh, and, and I, I love that uh, experience. Uh, so I've, I, because you know of those experiences, I've I've read a good bit, number of of books for young people and children. Um, but I read more adult books written especially for adults now, but I've learned to, that I can listen to them on Audible and then sleep through a couple of thousand years in, in some cases. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really matter too much. <laughs> Nobody's giving me an exam on them. <laughs> this, this is, yeah, but this is why, I mean, name the children's book that's any good, well, name the book that's any good. Name the children's book where you can skip 100 pages and still know what's happening. You can't. No. They, you, they don't exist. Where I could, I could, I could pull books off the shelf. That, you know, um, I remember throwing a book across the room in college. It was a library book because I realized after reading the entire novel um, that I could have cut 200 pages out of the middle with a knife, and no one would have noticed. It didn't matter at all. It was. It went off on this circular side plot, came back around, and then rejoined the main story. And I thought, who? 
why do just because we wanted it to be longer or we you know this is you're getting paid by the pound here or something i mean no <laughs> just well, Dickens, yeah. That, that's whatever. why Dickens', Dickens books are Dickens, so long. Yes, I, Dickens I, was I, being paid I by the world. Said, I love Dickens, but he needed Virginia Buckley to be his editor. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes. War and Peace is the gift for your teenager. Yes. Comes to mind there. Uh, also, if you'd read that aloud, you'd still be on it. <laughs> if you had continued reading that along. Uh, I do throw that in as a little commercial to remind you that we do have a book table. Uh, at the end, so you can purchase books by both Catherine and Kim. I want to open it up for a few minutes to the floor. Can I take the mic out? Yeah, we can check. Yes, it. okay. So, any questions or comments uh, for Catherine or Kim? I'm walking toward you. Someone take the mic. Or I'll just hand it out randomly. I can't read. I can't hear it. You may have to answer the question. How do you make your characters come to life in people's minds? How do you make your characters come to life in people's minds? That's where the seven and a half drafts come in. Because the first time I'm writing the story, so when you read it, it's all finished. And it all seems like it all fits together like a jigsaw puzzle. But sometimes I'm picking up one piece at a time. And so I'm thinking, okay, here's something I know about this character, and I'm, and I'm writing that. And then by the time I get to the end, I think, oh, but this character also you know, has, has this part of their personality, so now I have to go back and put that in here. And we go through, and then we find out something else that's important about them, and we have to go back and make sure that's part of the whole story. And there are writers that do this faster than I do, but that's how I do it, is I just have to keep thinking a little bit more. And you have to realize that everybody's complicated. So if you write somebody that's all good or all bad, that's a lot harder to believe than somebody who's mostly good or mostly bad. Um, most people are mostly good and then have some times where they make mistakes. So I think that's helpful if you, if you can see that the character has made a mistake, but that doesn't mean that they're an evil person. Um, they're just a person that made a mistake. And then, but then how do they react to that mistake? Do they try to make it better? Do they try to pretend it didn't happen? Are they afraid? What do the other characters do when they make that mistake? Are they angry at them? Uh, do they even notice? I mean, you know, what if you like made some big mistake and nobody cared? You'd feel like nobody was paying attention at all. So this, this, you keep going through it like that. It's kind of like a painting where you're doing a different color and a layer over and over. I think uh, Kim is exactly right. I think one reason you do a lot of free writing is because you don't know your characters to begin with. And people say, how do you create a character? And I thought, I don't create characters. I get to know them. And I get to know them better the longer I live with them. And as Kim was saying, you know, when you first start, they can't the boy might say something, and you get to the end, and you think, he would never have said that. <laughs> so you have to go back and rewrite it in, the, in your new knowledge of this person. It's, it's like getting to know a friend. You don't know what to expect of them initially. Uh, you're exploring who they are. And, and people say, do you put real people in your book? And I think, no because real people are so complicated, nobody would ever be able to believe them. So you have to make them a little less complicated <laughs> than real human beings. And, uh, you know, I, I had a, a, a childhood friend who was a very round little boy, and he wanted to be a ballet dancer. Well, he grew up to be a ballet dancer. And I always wanted to write a book about Eugene, but he's unbelievable. <laughs> you know? uh, and I mean, he's much more complicated than I'm telling you. Uh, and so uh, you have to, you have to uh, not create them, but get to know them. And then um, you don't, of course, other human beings, you can't read their minds. But you can always read your characters' minds, and that's very helpful to a writer. 
uh, to be able to read the mind of the character. And also it allows the reader to read the mind of someone else, which you can't do in real life, which is a great opportunity um, to get to, to uh, live inside somebody else's head. Do you have any characters that you've that have stayed with you a long time since you've written about them when they're children and you're kind of curious about how they ended up as adults? Do you ever revisit anybody? Do we have any characters that we've gotten to know um, for such a long time that we, we go back and revisit them as adults? I, um, I don't have any that I've, I've written anything published about. There are authors that do that. Madeline Lingle comes to mind as someone who has done whole genealogies and, and intermixed characters at different stages in their lives. Um, my books are just often set in very different worlds. I did, though, one time just for fun because I had a character that, or somebody emailed me and pointed out that the next day was my character Ada's 87th birthday because her actual <laughs> birth date is in the book. And so I wrote a blog post about what Ada did on our 87th birthday, and I felt like that was really easy to know. But, you know, but Ada at 26 is a lot harder for me to get my mind around, so we'll see. Well, I always kind of feel, I, I've, I haven't ever done a sequel uh, because I always feel that at the end of the book, I've disturbed their lives long enough, and they should be allowed to go ahead and live without me. Um, and, you know, every now and then I think I might meet one on, on the street and say, nod and say hello, and, and they might recognize me and nod and say hello, and, and uh, we both go our separate ways, uh, which is hokey. <laughs> but you do, uh, when you've lived with characters for a year or two or three, they become very real to you, as, as real as people you, you m or more real than many people uh, that you meet. So you do love them and you care about them and you want them to live happily after they, you're through making their lives difficult. <laughs> I've been asked a couple of times for sequels that I have absolutely no intention of ever writing, um, most recently for Fighting Words, and I said, well, I want you to decide what happens next. You know? And if I write what happens next, then what happens next is a fixed thing. But if you in your imagination, this is, as Catherine was saying, the reader is a co-writer. You know, if you are imagining what happened next, it could be anything at all. And there's, there's kind of a lot more story to that. Although I did see Ada and Jamie running through the London sub, one, uh, not sub, metro, whatever the, there's the two, thank you. I was uh, in London after I had written The War That Saved My Life, and a brother and sister did. They, they just went racing past in the, in the sort of labyrinth of the tube, and I went like that, and my daughter said, what, what? And I said, that's Ada and Jamie. And she looked after and went, eh, that's not what I think they look like. Again, it was exactly what I thought they looked like, but you know, she thought they looked different because when she read the book, she read something different. So. I'm a retired English teacher, and um, I've read many of both of your books, and I love them. But I'm wondering if you've had the distinction of being on a banned books list for a theme or uh, maybe the use of the word snow, which <laughs> <laughs> is ra uh, rather obvious yeah. if you have an imagination. I'm sure you could put the word in instead of that. But I'm concerned about the environment that books are being read in and that parents are a little hypersensitive and overprotective about what their children are reading instead of letting them get exposure to real characters and real life. Yeah, I, I'm, ex I'm, I'm concerned about that too because, um, you know, I've, I've had, um, I have not to my knowledge been on any banned list. I am expecting it hourly for fighting words, to be honest with you. Um, I have had uh, people that were strongly against the war that saved my life, parents. 
uh, because of, of things that they were perceiving in the book. And um, almost always my response when a, child, a parent says, do you think this is appropriate for your child? I said, I don't know because I don't know your child. Because, I mean, there's, I wrote a book uh, a long time ago called For Freedom, which is a World War II story. And when it came out, my son was 10, which is technically of the age to read it. And he said, should I read it? And I said, no, you shouldn't. You will get nightmares. You know, we've been down this road. Put it aside for a few years. I don't, he's 26. I don't think he's read it yet. But it wasn't a good book for him. And I think any parent has the right to say, this is not a good book for my child for some reason. But inevitably, when these parents are wanting to ban the book for everybody, they haven't read it. And they're saying, uh, no, I just heard it was about you know, sexual assault. I don't want my kid knowing anything about that. OK, take your kid out of it. But first of all, read the book and, and decide. And second of all, you, know, you don't get to decide for everybody else. And some of the stuff that's happening right now is, is really just um, off the edge, uh, in Texas, they have a rule, they had a rule now that they just passed it in one school district, that everything in history, you have to present um, the opposite side of the story, at, or the opposite point of view, which, I mean, it was all over Twitter because someone was telling teachers that they had to present the opposite point of view of the Holocaust in history. And I'm not sure what that would be. We didn't kill enough people? I mean, you know, that's not, I mean, this is really a hard one to wrap your head around. And that becomes the sort of a cycle if you're thinking about it as, you know, I don't want to learn anything unpleasant. And so uh, I, I think you have the right to, to say your kid isn't ready for a specific thing, but not the right that everybody else's kid isn't. Uh, I'm. <clears throat> Very hard of hearing, so I'm not sure I heard everything you said uh, clearly enough. But uh, yes, I've been on a lot of bad book lists, and uh, if if I and very often I'm not told about it. But when I am told about it, uh, our uh, embattled librarian writes to me or calls me. I immediately know where to send them for help that will be um, better help than I can give. But um, I also, if, uh, want to help, you know, just support them because uh, pe when people hear that I, one of my books has been banned, they said, aren't you proud? And I said, no, because every challenge are banning means that some brave teacher or librarian is putting their jobs and reputation on the line to protect something I've written. And how can I feel good about that? Because my life is not being threatened, but theirs very definitely is. And um, so it's not, it's not something to laugh about or brag about. It's something to be deeply concerned about. Um, and I do, if a parent writes me, or I say, you know, I'm so grateful that you care about your child and want to protect your child. Um, every child should have a caring parent. Uh, I don't believe that's the best way to protect a child, but that's, uh, you know, we're different, and I recognize that. Uh, but uh, I did get, uh, I was sent um, a clipping from a um, school district where the teachers or librarians were being asked to recommend or books or talk about books uh, that might be bought for the school district, and this one woman was very, very unhappy about racial therapy, and um, so I didn't know her personal address, but I wrote to the school district, wrote her letter in care of the school district, uh, just to say, you know, this is why Jess says Lord, and why his father says damn in hell, 
Um, and uh, it's the way the people I know in that area talk. Uh, and I was trying to be faithful to my characters. Um, but, I, and I realize that, that you feel very differently about it. And I am truly sorry to have offended you, but I did, I wrote the book as best I knew how. And she wrote me back a personal letter and she said, you don't know how much it means to me to know that someone has listened. And I thought, oh boy, how important it is, friends, for us to listen to people that we don't agree with, please. <laughs> I mean, this country would be a different place, this world would be a different place if we would just shut our mouths up, stop arguing, stop even trying to be rational, just shut up and listen because people are desperate to be listened to. And In the interest of getting us to the book table, I'm going to ask uh, Catherine to go ahead and read us a little preview of her new novel, Birdie's Bargain, and then we'll wrap up and we'll adjourn. So uh, I'll see if I can set up a mic. Bertie is a little bit angry that God hasn't reset time so that bad things haven't happened. And she's had to move to a brand new school where she didn't have any friends. At the thought of that, being alone and friendless, when God knew perfectly well that she was shy and had a hard time making friends, Remember that first summer at Bible camp? The rock inside her that had kept the tears dammed up broke loose. She began to cry like a baby, so loudly that she was sure her grandmother would hear her through the walls. She pulled the covers as well as the pillow over her head and cried into the black cave they made. When the final flood finally subsided, she wiped her nose on the pillowcase. Of course, that was it. That was what she had to do. Bertie sat straight up on the bed, then hesitated. Maybe with something this important, she'd better kneel and show God she meant business. Reverend Colston always said it was good to kneel down when you prayed. It showed you were humble before God. Bertie got down beside her bed. I think they're telling me to shut up. Uh, the cover tickled her nose. Um, and she'd make, but she'd make the bed up after. Now she put her hands together like that praying hands picture they hang in the churches. Okay, God, no. Dear Heavenly Father, that was better. Dear Heavenly Father, I'll stop acting like a jerk if you'll start acting like God and take care of us for a change. No, erase that last part. I'll get up right now and start acting normal if you'll, I mean, 
I will love you in Jesus and be a witness in the world if, if you will just keep my daddy safe. Okay? Deal? Promise? Love, Bertie. I mean, I'm in. Slowly, she opened her eyes and stood up. Light was pouring through the one small window onto the floor. Light. I am the light of the world. Jesus said that. It was like Noah's rainbow, a promise. God was telling her it was a bargain. If also me in closing to announce we do have one more event this fall. Uh, and if you're interested, we are hosting Peter Croft, whose grandfather was J.B. Phillips, a well-known Bible translator and writer. Um, and Peter will be here on November the 8th to close our fall programming. But this has been a particular highlight for the fall. I'm so glad that you are here for this moment. And please join me in thanking Catherine Patterson and Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. We're going to part the waters uh, to go back to the book signing table. So. It's